my talk. Here we go. Uh. Ah, he said he living life as a gringo. Where you question, where you fit, and every time you mingle, they say you do this with not enough that. My rapping is really bad. <laughs> this life as a gringo. Yes, hello and welcome to another episode of Life as a Gringo. I am Dramos, of course. And man, I am excited to bring you today's conversation. So uh, I recorded this last week and just an amazing, amazing conversation. Like one of those things where you bring on a guest because they're doing some really interesting and incredible work and you don't really know where the conversation is going to go. And then you are just surprised in the best way possible. So that was the, the case for today's conversation. And my guest is Eliana Reyes, who is an actor, a model, a host, a producer. Um, she has a, a TV show on uh, my old TV network, LATV. She's also director of uh, a new documentary called Vida Nueva, which we will get into. It's all about her father being released from prison. And just, I think, in general, a really interesting conversation that we're going to have around the nuances around the nuance of being Latino and and just all of us having different experiences. And it doesn't mean that someone's experience is more authentic or more important than the other. And I, I don't even want to just like try to preference it because it was just a really interesting conversation where I felt like we were just talking as two individuals that are interested in learning more and doing better um, and, and doing the work for our community and who are you know, making that kind of our, our life's work. So I'm really excited to share this conversation with y'all. Um, she's a, an incredibly, uh, well, she's an incredible talent and has a great point of view. So I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to, to bring bring her on. And I think, man, without further ado, we'll just kind of get into it. You know, this is one of those ones I just want to lay this conversation on you. I think you're going to be inspired. I think it's going to make you think a, a little bit and um, hopefully you'll see a bit of yourself in in the topics that we're talking about today. So Without further ado, let's uh, let's get into this week's conversation with Eliana Reyes as a part of our Mi Gente segment. Mi Gente! My guest today is an actor as well as the producer of all Afro-Latino content on my family, LATV Network including Black Dignidad and Shades of Beauty. She's also a filmmaker with the new docu-film Vida Nueva. Eliana Reyes, how you feeling? <laughs> What's that, Dramos? I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling, I'm feeling better now being on here with you. Oh, I appreciate that. We, we were just talking off mic about how this has been like a back and forth for the last couple of weeks. I got like the flu one week. I think you got sick the next week. So it's been and then like I got the flu. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's been going on, but but now we're here and we're making it happen. And I'm, I'm really excited because you got so many different things going on that are that I think are really interesting. But I think most importantly, first and foremost, what I love about you is you are a creator who is also trying to do it in a positive way. Right. Because I think that in the world that we live in today, the the things that generally speaking get the attention are the things that are sensationalism, right? The things that are kind of the worst parts of humanity tend to be the ones that get like the most viral moments and um, get the most ratings right. and things like that. And those of us who are trying to change that narrative, it's a really fucking mm -hmm. long and hard path to get there because we're just up against like societal norms for whatever reason that... Right trash content just seems to to go to the top so i, I always love speaking to people like yeah. yourself because i think you understand the sort of struggle that happens behind the scenes of like trying to do this without sacrificing your morals i guess i would say yeah i mean i think that's something that that's at, i like it's at the core of who i am sure. you know what i'm saying like i i try to think even when I'm planning the shows, when I'm planning the content, everything is through a racial lens, mm. right? Everything is through a lived experience. Everything is through a disenfranchisement, a mm. nuance. Right. And it's like, how can we have these conversations in a way that's aspirational mm -hmm. and that um, doesn't put us in this like angry black people sure. or angry pe uh, people of color corner, Yeah. right? Because that's what society has done to us forever when we talk about things that matter to us, yeah. right? Um, and so it's become kind of a mission of my, even in my own storytelling, right? Like, um, how can I tell 
see stories of things that have changed me at a cellular level Mm -hmm. without sensationalizing the trauma per se, but showing the art behind um, getting through it, moving through it and, Mm -hmm. and what's waiting for you on the other side of it. Because I feel like, you know, in fast content world or just in the world right now, like we're so addicted to like, what's ha- like what's happening right here right now in front of us mm-hmm. and i feel like when you start um putting more love and attention into like what's waiting for you on the other side of it you just move differently sure you know what i'm saying and then you're less likely to um I, for me personally i'm less likely to get caught up in in like the drama or mm-hmm. the whatever's happening because you want know I me mean? when i'm going through shit yeah I'm yeah like, <laughs> do your thing. <laughs> like even when i'm going through shit like I'm like, there's times where like I want to talk about stuff, you know, yeah. but I'm also like, okay, yo, like let me let me get past it. Yeah. Right? Let me figure out what my nuggets are. What am, what am I supposed to learn here? Or what am I supposed to share? Mm-hmm. And then you'll see me throw a little post like, here's what I learned. Right. This past season of Mercury Retro right. home because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. It's and it's it's funny because I think like I the the irony of like doing the right thing and and trying to be a human being that others can look up to in a way right and and respect the irony is that that's actually more difficult than it is to be an asshole right like if you were to just fly (laughs) off the handle on social media every time you got pissed off about something and like didn't actually take a second to think about it like that's far easier to do than it is to pause in a moment and not you know react to something or not react to a negative comment that you get or whatever it might be right and it, it's like this discipline that I feel like goes unnoticed. And it's also like you're putting a part of yourself out there. Right. And you're you're really exposing yourself to the world and their judgments and mm-hmm. everybody that knows you in your personal life. And now they're seeing this other side of you that they may have never experienced before. And now they have their own preconceived judgments of things. And it's right. a lot. And and even I can imagine, I'd love to pick your brain on on this because when I was doing my my show on LA TV and I was doing a lot of like heavy politics stuff, you know, it was draining after a while to be that plugged <laughs> in. You know what I'm saying? Like to be that <laughs> plugged into all of the fuckery that is happening in the world and this country specifically. Like it was really draining to have to be on top of that so much. And I can imagine as as yeah. important as you you know the work is to educate our community um you know and break free of, of like the generational curse of just internalized racism as 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 important as that work is to do i'm sure it's exhausting to on a regular basis have to talk about race relations uh, as, as a black woman um in in the latin community yeah yeah it's exhausting <laughs> I, i'm passionate about it but it's exhausting right yeah. and i think that um one of the things that i try to do is focus on how this is building community mm. and how this is helping people shift their perspective. Right. You know what I'm saying? And that kind of keeps me a little balanced. And again, I also try not to, I focus on lived experiences, mm. right? Because once I start making, once I become the face of like end all be all statement, mm-hmm. then I open the door for like so many different things right so i'm like here's a lived experience i'm very careful with even when you know when i post the clip i'm not saying like you know ramo said Mm -hmm. you know why a a pink is better than than purple yeah you know i i in the comment i make sure that the person that's assisting me with social that i'm like in drama's experiences Mm -hmm. this is what he has felt has worked out for him for him purple has worked better than pink right do you see what i'm saying so that opens the door to kind of like oh well, this is drama's lived experience, mm-hmm. but mine is different. Right. And though that kind of back and forth, that kind of dialogue and that kind of social discourse, I welcome, right? Mm-hmm. You're always gonna get told. I got people that fat shame me too because I mm-hmm. I host one of the shows. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm one of the hosts of Black TV that. And all the time, especially if we're talking about food or if we're talking about like anything that has to do with wellness or for like there's so many people that have been like, Oh, like why is she talking about food? She's fat or mm-hmm. this and this and that and it's like, you know, me. Even five years ago, before I decided, because when I had left my corporate career, like six, seven years ago, and decided to get into modeling and acting, 
I did as an act of revolution mm. because in our culture, we fat shame a lot, especially yeah. the women in our families. Like, mm-hmm. la gordita, yeah. ah, la gorda. To this day, my family calls me gorda. Mm. And I now, you know, I take it as a, as a, kind of like a, what do you say, like a, a term of endearment. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, like, it's like, of course I internalize that. Of course. I grew up thinking, oh, yo soy muy gorda para esto. Mm. Or they were, you know, my hair, que yo tenía el pelo malo. Right. Like, it was like all these things that when I decided to be like, yo, I'm going to become a model and mm. an actor and put myself in front of people, it was an active revolution, right? And seven years later, yeah. <laughs> the very thing that I was most scared of, people are still doing. And so yeah. um, you, just, you just have to find the balance of like, yo, I want to put this out. I want to do good, but also I'm going to protect myself, right? right. And I'm going to try to do it in a way um, because I do feel like there's a lot of clickbait, mm-hmm. right? And, and you know, people could argue clickbait is has its purposes or whatever. You know, I'm not going to get into that. Sure. But at the end of the day, when we're talking about, like, when we're talking about lived experiences based on your appearance, something mm-hmm. like something as, as, um, as powerful yet yet fragile as your race Mm -hmm. like how you are perceived Mm -hmm. that's not something i can control right i can't control that i was born morenita con con pelo más rizo than my sister right right Uh, somebody of a darker skin complexion can't control that so once we start nitpicking at how they were born Mm -hmm. i just that level of of bullying and trolling for me like i don't i don't have patience or or like um i have tolerance for because i'm like we need to be able to have conversation Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying like uncomfortable conversations at that too. Sure. Right? Um, in a way that's productive. So yeah, I don't know. I feel like I talked a lot there. So. <laughs> <laughs> nah, you're good. You're good. I I I, I, <laughs> I agree with what you're what you're saying. I think the the thing that resonated with me uh, when you were talking about that you try not to speak in kind of broad sentences or, or paint with a broad brush, right? And but the fucked up thing is that because you know outside of something like LA TV, that's an anomaly, right? Where you have the ability to have an entire Latin cast or an entire Afro Latino cast, you know, and behind the scenes, it's Latinos, you know, um, producing and running the cameras and things like that. But in the rest of media or in the rest of the world, what oftentimes happens is you become someone's representation for an entire group of people. Right. So, like, I remember when I was doing radio and I was with The Breakfast Club, I was the representative for Latinos everywhere right on that show. And I was expected yeah. to be that. If there was anything Latin related, I was the one they put the focus on to speak on it. And then I was judged based upon how well I did on that conversation in the broad sense, essentially. Right. So it's it's really yeah, difficult. Yeah. And, and that's why things like representation are so important, because it's also this unfair burden that we carry where in our everyday lives, even if you're not in a media space, if you live in a neighborhood where it's not predominantly Latino, you are the inherent yeah. representative for it, right? And what you do or don't do and, and how you're considered as a, a good or bad neighbor speaks for the rest of the entire community almost based upon these these closed-minded people's ideas and their um, vision of entire group of people. And that in itself is like this crazy, heavy, weird burden to fucking carry on your shoulders uh, a- as well. Yeah, it is. I mean, honestly, you know, I'm not I'm not someone that get anxious about a lot of like you know things like that like i'm very much so like in my mind at least i'm mm-hmm. like oh i could do it this i could go with the flow but that's one of the things that does make me nervous right is that um not only being afro latina being plus size afro latina mm-hmm. being a millennial afro latina who does speak spanish right who mm-hmm. spoke spanish first technically than english mm-hmm. um i have a very and also add to that I lived in the Midwest for a big chunk of time. I'm, I lived in Minneapolis, you know, mm. so like I finished high school, did college in Minneapolis. You know, I was very heavily involved in the black community there because when I got there, they were like, yo, we don't know why you speak with that accent, but you're one of us. Right. So like these, these white folks, they're not going to look at you and be like, hmm, yeah. you're that kind of black. Right. So we're right. going to treat you different because you're this kind of black. Mm-hmm. No, they were like, yo, you're not white. You got texture in your hair and you got color in your skin. So, you know. We're going to, you're going to get this treatment. And yeah. in Puerto Rico and in New York, even in DR, we, we were just all, you know, it, it wasn't so, that wasn't so much the conversation. So mm-hmm. then when I'm moving, you know, to LA and then I get on Black Unidad and I start talking, I start realizing that I have a very unique lived experience as an Afro-Latina who 
had to advocate, especially when I was in corporate, had to advocate for black women mm. and Latinas. Mm. But even in, but, but then also not being accepted as a Latina mm -hmm. or fully as a black woman. Right. Right. So it was like, there's that intricacy when I start talking and when I start talking about my lived experience mm -hmm. and my generalization statements, you know, that's when I see a lot of people starting to come in and nitpick at it. But it's like, you don't know what it's like to be someone who looks like me with my name, with my accent, living in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and so that identity piece. And also, you don't know what it's like when, when the shit hits the fan. And, you know, like I personally, George, George Floyd used to be the doorman of the Dominican, the only Dominican spot in Minneapolis, two blocks away from where I live. Mm, wow. A lot of us people of color, a lot of us black folk, we knew George. Yeah. You know, a lot of us knew Philando as well. Mm. So when the shit hit the fan, you're in the streets with your people. And it doesn't yeah. matter what shade of black you are, because we know that there's one common goal. Yeah. So I didn't get to be like, today I get to be this kind of black. Yeah. Tomorrow I get to be black American and tomorrow I get to, and the next day I get to be Afro Latina. Right. You know, no, right. I, ha I had a responsibility and a passion behind because I knew what I represented. Mm -hmm. So coming out to LA has been a little interesting because here things are a little more compartmentalized mm -hmm. is what I'm realizing. I'm going to be here for like a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're having these conversations, these nuanced conversations about blackness, about Afro Latino ness, about our connection to our roots. Mm -hmm. and just amongst the cast right you can and and the guests that we bring in you can see there's so many different different lived experiences and we really got to stop policing people's lived experiences mm. you know what i'm saying like mm. you can have your own lived experience and that is very true to you and you might even have feelings about other people's lived experiences because it triggers maybe your lived experience sure. but you cannot police someone else's lived experience and tell them that they're wrong for something that they single-handedly lived through and right. had to survive through. And when people from disenfranchised communities speak up and start talking about these lived experiences, the last thing I think we should be doing, especially as people of color, I mean, yet alone white people, mm -hmm. but like, we shouldn't be saying like, oh, you don't get to feel that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just kind of like, ah, you know, like that's what happened to you or that's how you feel. Like, wow, you know what I'm saying? This is my experience. Right. And now let's try to find where we can meet in the middle so that we can come together, you yeah. know? Absolutely. So, I think, yeah, it's it's like this caste system that cre gets created, right? Where like we create our own internal caste system, like of even yeah. the idea of like who's Latin enough, right? Because you're speaking uh, to, yeah. to something, You're I'm on the complete other end of it where I'm not Latin enough because I didn't speak Spanish because my complexion is light, right? And, and my own family in Puerto Rico will call me a gringo because I lived in the States, you know what I mean? And I didn't speak proper Spanish. Yeah. So it, and then it's like, but for me, I'm like, what the fuck am I then? I feel, um, I feel the culture running through me. I want to advocate for it. But then you're yeah. also telling me that I don't belong here, right? Because my experience is different than yours. And, and it's, it's also interesting because I, I've heard this conversation. I'd love to kind of pick your brain on it where I think somebody was criticizing John Leguizamo for referring to Latinos as people of color, right? And they were mm. basically saying like someone like him with his complexion, he's not a person of color. But my my sort of thought process with that is, but you put him in a room of all white people, white people are gonna be like, he's light skinned, but he's not white. He's not one of us, right? And yeah. that's, that's sort of what my experience is. So it's like, I'm not gonna claim yeah. whiteness when I know what happens when I'm in a room full of white people, I am always the other person. So I'm curious right. what your thought process is. I mean, obviously speak for your own lived experience or your own uh, opinion with that, but it, it is an interesting yeah. conversation. I think that it's all, um, for me personally, what I've noticed and having been in all white spaces and having been in all black spaces mm. and having been in like African spaces too, because I have a lot of West African friends, Sure, you know, um, I think that it's, it's subject to the spectrum of what you're looking at it by, mm -hmm. right? Because I just said this on another podcast interview that I have. It's like, there's layers of disenfranchisement, mm -hmm. unfortunately, yeah. right? And so our someone like you, your experience against whiteness is very different to like a darker skin, even darker than me, sure. their experience against whiteness, right? And the institutional racism that was built to keep that person that looks like that down. Mm -hmm. Right. That doesn't minimize the otherness that you feel when you walk into the room. Mm -hmm. um, I go through being Afro-Latina 
and being considered, even though, you know, camera right now, I look pretty caramel, but I'm pretty like red. I get pretty penny copper in the summer. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm still considered like a light skinned Afro Latina in the broad spectrum of blackness. Sure. Right. When you talk about like darker women, my hair can get, you know, it can get from a, a 3C to a 4A, mm -hmm. depending on the day of the summer and the humidity. Right. You know, and, you know, I, I think that what people are trying to say sometimes is that there's this, these layers of disenfranchisement yeah. based on yeah. your proximity to what is considered whiteness. Sure. Right. And, but, you know, whiteness just in the sense of color, because whiteness in the sense of your skin color is not whiteness in the sense of your privilege and your mm. lived experience. Right. Right. And that's something that I learned in the Midwest. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Where it's like, th th there's even some weird shit that happens among white people where it's like, there's like white people and then there's like the hippie white people that are like the ones that are out marching in the streets and they're right. down for the cause and whatever. And there's even some weird other myths amongst them. Yeah. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's, 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 uh, it's like lived experience, it's culture, it's mm -hmm. language, it's hair texture, it's even like your vibe, right? Because mm -hmm. One thing that sets me aside, I can say this wholeheartedly, when I've been around like a group of Latinas, you know, um, and I show up with my big curly hair and I speak with more of an urban accent, I move my hands a lot, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not super polished and like, you know, and so it automatically puts me into like this like, like urban black girl, um, category. Right. And it's like, and I love being that because that's, that's, that's what I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I'm my family. I'm like I'm born in Washington Heights. I yeah. grew up in Puerto Rico and DR. And then yeah. I was in Minneapolis. I went to school in the hood in North Minneapolis. Yeah. So like it's, it's interesting how just even the way we present ourselves, the mm -hmm. way we dress, our accent, all of that gives us these, these nuanced, um, kind of layers of otherness. Yes. You know, and the truth is, yeah. People, there's people that have more otherness than others. But mm -hmm. when you put it like, for example, John Leguizamo, when he's in a room full of white people, yeah, he's the other person. Yep. Or because of his accent. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of times there's an interview I saw that he said that he um, he used to have to stay away from the sun just so that he wouldn't get darker. Mm -hmm. You know, and mm -hmm. I got to interview Carlos Carrasco, mm -hmm. who, I mean, what a perfect example of like, <laughs> you know, he's Afro-Panamanian. Yeah. We know him from, you know, Star Trek and... Mm -hmm. uh, Blood in, blood out. Mm -hmm. And when he arrives, he's Shakespearean train, yo. Like, mm -hmm. this man went through, he has, like, damn near a doctorate on, like, mm -hmm. Shakespearean, like, training and acting. Mm -hmm. And they will always make him the maleante. Right. Just right. because of the way he looks, mm -hmm. right? And right. it's like, and and it's like, they couldn't figure out if he was black, yeah. but then he was too black to be Latino. You right. know what I'm saying? But then it's like, he didn't, but then, it, but then when he would play the maleante, and he would speak with his Shakespearean acting to be like, okay, you're not black enough. And right. he's like, but I'm Shakespearean trained. He's like, I don't know how to speak. What do you mean I don't speak black enough? You know right, what I'm saying? Like, right. So I just feel like we got to stop generalizing everything yeah. and get more into the macro because it's very nuanced. It's yes. like Latinidad. We can't, you can't look at Latinidad as like this big thing. You, mm -hmm. you gotta, you gotta dive in because the only thing that unites us is that we're we're a group of colonized people yeah. <laughs> that yeah. were told, "Hey, y'all are in this group now, and this is y'all's language, this is y'all's religion, and y'all figure it out." Yeah, you know. Yeah. And within within that y'all, there's over a hundred different experiences, cultures, mm -hmm. nuances. There's several indigenous roots. Mm -hmm. There's several variations of West African roots. So you can't expect one size to apply all yeah i think that that's why conversations that you have on a regular basis and conversations like this one are so critical because a lot of mm -hmm. us are just uneducated and don't have the vocabulary so we just make it this very broad assumption right or a lot of us refuse to or or just are unable to see are ignorant to seeing things from somebody else's lens right we just think that everybody has the same experience as as ourselves you know and that's why educating yourself and again, these conversations where we dive into like it's nuance and there's no way in hell you could just break it down to like one category of like person and their right. experience type of thing. That's why this is is, is so important. Like I, I, I love that, you know, all that you just said on that. 
um, because I think it's like it's almost like it, at times it becomes this idea of like the trauma Olympics. You know what I'm saying? Where it's like mm -hmm. it's like my trauma is worse than yours, so you're not allowed to even talk about your trauma at the end of the day, right? And and listen, there are obviously levels to this shit, but trauma is trauma, and somebody the way somebody feels trauma they're going to feel that deeply. You know what I'm saying? J to them, it's just as deep as what you're feeling, even if in sort of real yeah. world consequences, it's not playing out as lethally potentially as, you know, uh, you as a black man or a black woman getting pulled over by the police, right? Even if they don't share in that same, you know, fear, trauma feels like trauma, right? Like what I, what I went through feels like what I went through. And to minimize that because you, you, I don't know you want to it's almost like we're glorifying our trauma right and our trauma is better than your trauma to a degree and it's like we're all just people who are fucking mm. suffering because of colonization that happened and white supremacy that continues to happen and we're all dealing with it in different ways and we're all battling you know similar but also different generational curses and i think you can't again like you said take away somebody else's lived experience you know just because i don't know it's almost like we don't it's, it's almost like it's this weird thing where we've almost like said uh, the tra like our trauma is like better than your trauma to a degree. Like it makes us a part of something, and it's it's just a weird yeah. weird mindset. I see what you're saying. Yeah, it's just so it's like it's I call it policing. It's mm. like we're like we're like saying like hmm, like you know that's not right because mine was it wasn't like that. Right. Or you know yours you shouldn't feel as bad as you do because I went through something worse. And I think at the end of the day, at the, the root cause of it, we just have disenfranchised people, yeah. different layers of disenfranchised people that just want to be heard. Yes. Right. They just want people just want to be heard. And when we don't have the language, when we don't have the moment of pause or the power of pause, mm. it just kind of comes out whichever way. And then we have this tool that is social media mm -hmm. that we can hide behind, that we can say whatever we want to say, which then another person interprets it and takes it out of context, yep. which then creates more, you know, so then it becomes yeah. this black hole of like, and everyone's missing the point. Right. right? Like, it's like right. That all the time. It's like, you, you get down to like 1500 comments and every single person is missing the point because everyone is just chiming in because yeah. they want to be heard. And right. so I'm a big advocate of like empowering ourselves to find spaces in our lives mm -hmm. where we can be heard. That's part of why, you know, when they when they were like, yo, we'd like for you to be a host on Black Media. I was like, okay, dope. But, you know, now a year later, I'm also producing because mm -hmm. to me it's important to, you know, bring on people and let them be heard and let yeah. them tell their story in the way that they want. It. It's so healing when we, storytelling is so important for mm -hmm. people of color or disenfranchised people. Like the, the ability to say like, yo, I went through this. This is how it impacted me. And this is who I am now because of it. Right. Like, that alone, <laughs> I swear to God, it, age, it retro ages you yeah. to just be able to be heard. Yeah. So I just encourage people like, you know, I go through it all the time where I see comments and I want to be, because I'm like, listen, <laughs> some of that me, like, I'm like mad, like calm and shit, but I'm, yeah. I'm an Aries, I'm hot headed, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I've just been, I've just been indoctrinated because I worked in corporate for so long and sure. I live in the Midwest where I, I have to learn how to like condense myself. Yes. So it's a it's it's become kind of a skill that I'm able to use, but I've been wanting to go the fuck off. Right. You know what I'm saying? I really, and then I have to step back and use my power of pause and yeah. be like, okay, what am I going to achieve? Right. Or can I take this topic that I see everyone is so pressed about, or this topic that people seem to be really passionate about, and make an episode about it and bring multiple different perspectives to talk about it? Right. I feel like. When I think about my legacy, because that's another thing too, we're in mm. fast, we're in fast culture right now, yep. right? Where we're in reactionary culture. Mm -hmm. Um, thanks to, thanks to the beauty that is technology and the curse that is technology, sure, right? Sure. But like when we think about legacy, right? Which is a long term thing. And I think that millennials were kind of the last of a dying breed that, mm -hmm. that have this very clear perception of like, legacy yeah like what footprint do you want to leave behind mm -hmm. you know and when you stop for a moment and you think about that you're going to care more about misinterpreting things or you're going to care more about what you put out there that can potentially be harmful for someone else right it's just a, it's, it's literally the difference between like taking a deep breath and just like going forward 
Yeah. But if you understand what legacy is and how, and if you understand the value that you have as a person, mm -hmm. then you're more likely to value the legacy that you're having, which then makes you more likely to just, just think twice before you start out here, you know, you start spreading hate and rumors and division and, you know, yeah. so I don't know. That's just me. I'm poetic in, in that way. So I'd be like, I'd be looking at the world in a very poetic way, but it just brings me hope because I don't, I don't ever want to lose that. You know what I'm saying? I don't ever want to lose that ability to like, um, see people's humanity. Yes. Because if I lose that in the space that I'm in with storytelling, with filmmaking, with yeah. even acting and modeling, like yeah. shit gets real dark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I, I think I, I love that point about our generation, you know, the millennial generation. We were the last ones that really had to have conversations like this face to face. You know what I mean? Like we, I remember what it was like before you would disagree with somebody in the comments and like you could try to troll them for whatever, how many characters like you actually had to have a conversation to somebody's face and you have to run on to them. You have to run into them in campus and be like, yo, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you, and you had to know the re real world repercussions for those conversations as well. Exactly. We were ready. We yeah. Were ready. <laughs> but, but like, I, I love what you, you said, like where it's just like everybody deserves to be heard. And I think the irony of all of that is we're creating a system and obviously now I'm generalizing into the broader sort of maybe infighting that happens within our culture. But we're in that sort of trauma Olympics. We're saying, no, you're not you don't deserve to be heard. And then the irony is we're also then like talking to white people and like you're refusing to hear us. You know what I'm saying? But it's like none of us are wanting to hear the other people. And at the end of the day, if yeah. white people were willing to, you know, to sit down and have that conversation, of course, there are, are many who do. But you know, those who are still pushing against old narratives, if they genuinely were just willing to sit down and, and like hear your lived experience and and say, the, you know, when you feel un, when you walk into a room full of white people or you are uh, pulled over by the police and you feel uncomfortable, let me hear why that is. Right. What is coming up for you rather than writing it off as like that's a you problem, blah, blah, blah. Right. So it's like all of us yeah. collectively as human beings are refusing to hear other people. And I think at the end of the day, that's like the root of why we still have, you know, this bullshit going on now where like white supremacy still is a thing that and actually might be even worse than it's been in my lifetime, um, you know, as of mm -hmm. late, where it's still this conversation where we're all just beating our heads against the wall. If we would just shut the fuck up for a second and just listen to what the other side is trying to say as well. Yeah, I think, you know, what, what historically what we've seen is this unfortunate kind of adaptation or like learned behavior mm. of the colonizer. Yeah. Right. Because so if something is done to you for long enough mm. and often enough, mm -hmm. you're only going to start doing it to other people. Sure. Right. And so I think that a lot of what we do to each other, a lot of what happens amongst us, mm -hmm. you know, us being the broader population of like non-white people. Sure. Is this, this unfortunate inherited behavior of how we've been treated, mm -hmm. right? And so it, it, it's like a kid rebelling, yeah. you know? Like like Nas yeah. said it in one of his songs, right? He said, I don't know, something along the lines of like, America is a baby teething, like mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like yeah. asking for a feeding and whatever. Yeah. So it's like a, a lot of us are just like, we wanna be heard, we're pissed, mm -hmm. we're like, we're, we're trying to like break free from the, the indoctrination from the mm -hmm. colonization from the white supremacy we're trying to find our own spaces and when you when you get into the macro and you see just how many people are doing that all at the same time sure. obviously yeah. we're going to start looking next to each other and start fighting each other mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but when you take a moment and you zoom out you're like yo this is all orchestrated because of a great like there's something overarching happening here yes which is which is right the mm -hmm. the the powers that be the the the, the white supremacy the, the supremacy period that we're still yeah. operating under. I mean, I don't want to get into history, but like we're still operating under the same constitution, right? There's been a few amendments, but we mm -hmm. really haven't had like a, a a total revamp of what this country was built on. Sure. So I mean, there's a lot of archaic shit that we're seeing, and then we're seeing it now coming up again with people like DeSantis and all this shit. Mm -hmm. Like it's getting it's getting it's getting, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> that's getting weird again. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. um, so I just think us as people, like the more I'm a big fan of like 
me having a one-on-one conversation with you mm-hmm. is more healing than me standing in front of an angry group of people and yelling and nobody's hearing me. Yeah. Because what you and I can accomplish here will then propagate in a conversation that you have with someone else, which yeah. then propagates to a conversation that you have with someone else. So it kind of spreads by osmosis, right? Um, and I think that that's, that's something that I try to do in my personal life is like how much one-on-one impact can I have? How many times can I leave a conversation making someone think, damn, I should be thinking about a lived experience that's different than mine mm-hmm. or even myself too. Like, you know, like how can I become a more inclusive um, person and become more of an advocate for experiences that are different than my own? Yeah. You know, because yeah. the spectrum doesn't stop at me. Yeah. <laughs> it keeps going. And then when we get into like trans and we get into black trans, it, mm-hmm. it gets really complicated for their lived experiences. Yeah. You know? So, um, yeah, man, I just think we, we, we have to like do more self work. Yeah. Like I just, <laughs> we just got, we got to heal and we got to do more self work. For real though. That, that's that, at the root of it. Yeah. That's at the core where it, where, like I said, it, we're literally just a bunch of hurt people, like continuing the cycle on of, of hurting one another. Right. And, and like, you know, we're the hurt person and we're trying to find somebody else to unleash this hurt upon because somebody else did it to us. And and we're carrying around this burden, this weight of of generations of hurt people at the end of the day, you know, and that's why the self-work and all that shit is so important. And, you know, as woo woo and corny as people try to write it off as it's like that's that's yeah. the thing that are holding you back. That's what is, is leaving you angry. That is the thing that is making you um, a, a, a prime target for these politicians like Ron DeSantis, because at the end of the day, the dude, I don't, who knows how much of this ha- he actually believes. He just knows that if he riles these white people who feel disenfranchised enough and blames their disenfranchisement on a group of people, he knows that's a surefire way to at least get towards where he wants to go. Right. And that's what Trump did. It's Tr- manipulation. Exactly. It's manipulation at its finest. It's like right. we've seen this since like Greek mythology. Right. The power of persuasion. Exactly. This is like th- this is how you this is how you win a war. Right. Mm-hmm. This is how you strategize a war. You pick where the weakness is, and then you show the people that are victims of the weakness, this is happening because of this. Right. And then all of a sudden, through through social, through group conscious, people are like, oh, yeah, yeah. But mm-hmm. they don't even realize <laughs> it was like the Trump effect. I yeah. feel like it's the same thing that happened. It was yeah. just a bunch of, like, propaganda and, 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 like, and like words and, like, manipulation. Yeah. And then all of a sudden... It was like, oh shit! Look at look at what the fuck happened, you know? Yeah, um, I mean, it's it's the fa- it gets scary. It is. Well, I mean, it's to me it's scary the fact that this guy, a rich dude who was born into money and has had you know all these things, these opportunities handed to him, somehow was able to convince like working class people that he was their savior and actually gave a shit about them. You know what I'm saying? Like that that is is it just shows you like the sort of unhealed pain and and even like lack of self-awareness that so many people have in this world as to why they might be in the position that they're in today you know what i mean because even beyond yeah. even beyond race like there's classism you know what i mean there's you know there's a big difference between the Ableism. haves and the have nots yeah like all, all yeah. these different things and then it's just weaponized by people like trump and because none of us have many people haven't taken the time to like really reflect on why the way they feel the way that they do and and realize that you can't blame everything on external things you know there has to be some sort of internal thing you're battling as well again it's people not doing that work you're easily going to be manipulated by whatever voice you feel like kind of speaks to you in that moment um and and that's kind of where we are in this world and it's it's just it's incredibly scary on all these different levels but but yeah obviously what's happening with desantis and like this war on anything that is other it, it it is crazy to kind of think this is where we are in 2023 yeah it, it's it's definitely um it, it's one of the, i keep you know i i don't i try not to dive in too much until i i try to know shit that i gotta know sure because sure. my brain only has so much capacity yeah, right? yeah. and i'm not gonna let nobody like fear monger me like i'm like my my personal act of revolution is to keep self-evolving and continue doing things my way and opening doors for other people sure like that's how i fight against a lot of the stuff that I think is happening on the broader spectrum, because Mm -hmm. if I try to save the world from the broader spectrum, (laughs) like it becomes very overwhelming. Yeah. So for me, I try to like, I try to narrow it down and say like, okay, what do I have control of in my life? Right. One thing that I 
all the workshops that I've done, I, I do a lot of mentoring too. And so I, I always try to help people find like, what's your purpose? What's your drive? What are, what are your dreams? Because I feel like if we're more aligned with like who we're meant to be mm-hmm. and we're making decisions that are conducive to that purpose and that passion, we're less likely to be steered and geared whichever, which, whichever way society or fashion or, or these things that become trends can take us. Yeah. So just more rooted work, more grounding work, more getting to know yourself, more getting to know what drives you, what's your passion. What are you here for? Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter what you believe in. You, you don't have to believe in anything higher if you don't want to, to understand that you must be here for some reason. Right. 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 And so if you can find what that reason is and make your life about shining in that reason, I just feel like that will also propagate. So again, me living in my fantasy world, but I feel like it all boils down to like us doing a lot of the self work and us doing, trying to find those pockets where we can have impact and hope that our influence, um, the way that the the legacy that we leave with people, the legacy that we leave in our relationships, Mm -hmm. all we can hope for is that that grows and that it blossoms and that it, you know, it spreads and not, not saying that that's going to come back, you know, real life shit, like financial issues, economic issues, racial inequalities. It's not going to, but at least it brings me personally, it brings me hope and it helps me live a richer life um, in the spectrum of what my life is. My time is here on earth. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's, most definitely a start in the right direction, right? Because if everybody on earth was feeling fulfilled and happy, we're not going to have all the same issues that we have right now, right? Like like someone like Trump isn't going to be able to play upon like your yeah. disenfranchisement when you're feeling happy and fulfilled. You're going to be able to see through it at that point, right? You know, yeah. so yeah. It, it does start with that. And I, and I completely agree. I think, you know, there are so many people who, are not living in their purpose, are not leading a life that they're passionate about. And then it affects every other aspect of their personal life. You know, I can remember my father hated the job that he was working, you know, and growing up, he had a temper and he was, you know, always on edge because he lived 40 hours a week and fucking two hours each way in traffic dealing with this life that he was not happy about. And I think about myself where you talk about the way that all this has like a domino effect, these little these little interactions, right? I woke up happy as shit today that I'm getting to do what I do. And then I have a nice interaction with the male person that I ran into outside. And like, I don't know, they might then have a better interaction when they go home with their family or something like that. Right. Like all of it does add up. It's just collectively people sort of getting on the same page. I think of, again, that healing work and then also recognizing what the fuck actually matters in this life rather than the nonsense that we've been sold, you know, our our entire existence. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, you know, I. 100% 100% agree with you. Like, I saw a lot of that too growing up and I went through it myself, right? Yeah. Like, especially in the Midwest, there's a very like Midwestern life, which is mm-hmm. like, you get the nine to five and then you go get your master's yeah. and then you get engaged and then you buy a house. And I was like, yeah. I was always like, I just want to be creative. Like, right. I kind of rebelled against my own life, you yeah. know? And my family was like, what right. are you doing? Yeah. And I'm like, don't worry about me. Like, mind your business. <laughs> You know, but um, I also think, you know, in advocating for ourselves and advocating for our self-work, like we also got to advocate to make sure that like the resources to even have the language to have these conversations for ourselves are available to the most disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, a lot of us have a little more privilege than others. And so we're able to something as simple as like having the Internet, Mm -hmm. right? Something as simple as like having. You know, phone. Um, being able to read and that oh, phone, exactly like, yeah so I, I also think that in that advocacy it's like how can we reach equity in that you know how can the most disenfranchised have access to these opportunities and like accessible therapy and accessible yeah. you know resources and coaching um school programs mm-hmm. like you know so that they can then start the path to healing and start the path to like becoming a, a better a better version of themselves like it's not something that you can just will mm-hmm. out of nowhere you know because i feel like a, there's a lot of branding of like yeah. self-work right. do the self-work do the, but it's like when you're when you're in shambles yo yeah. and your life is a mess and you don't have resources and right. you're about to get evicted yeah. and you're afraid to there's a lot of shit at play yeah, or you grow right? up so, you're living in an area where you're hearing gunshots go off every night when you go to bed yeah. like i went i went to school in the bronx yeah. when i was in elementary school i got cousins who lived in the bronx and and all that like 
that was their reality every night going to bed. You know, they they would point out the bullet holes in the walls of their apartment building, you know. So, like, yeah. you ain't thinking about shit else aside from fucking surviving at that point. You know what I'm saying? It ain't like, oh, you're my morning routine. Eat. Yeah. Yeah, you're trying to eat, not get shot. Exactly. You know exactly. And not piss off. Yeah. Be on the neighborhood. Exactly. Like, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's it's like that, that that is my issue with like the whole wellness thing. And I think that's why it's important to not just have like white privileged faces, you know, uh, as, as the head of that, because a lot of the information yeah. isn't applicable to like people who are growing up in a certain way. Some of some people need like real world, you know, examples of how they can make it out of those situations that, um, you yeah. know, where, where shit not only talk about like people who are privileged enough, like my, I was privileged enough that I grew up in, in the suburbs by the time I was, you know, in a teenager and all that stuff. And my parents would never kick me out of the house. You know, I always had a place to go. So I was allowed to chase my creative endeavors in that way, let alone the kid whose parents came and afford to live there. You know, and they're telling you, you better get a job, help out or, or, you know, you can't stay here because yeah. we ain't got time to waste. You know, that that's like, there's so many yeah. layers to it that I think we forget. And that's why, representation is so important. I mean, even speaking to kind of the the work that that I know that you do, I mean, you talk about creating the narratives and content that you want to see in TV and Hollywood, right? And mm, mm, mm -hmm. it's easy to write it off as like, it's just TV, it's just movies. But I think we people uh, miss, people miss. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's not though, because it's like the reason why it's, you know, even outside of our of the Latin culture, even like the whole a big issue is like obviously LGBTQ uh, rights and things like that. The reason why yeah. it is so, you know, uh, controversial to have two men kissing or lead, two gay men leading a role in a movie is because none of us grew up where that was ever the normal thing. It was always a heterosexual white couple that and that's become the norm for a couple in a television thing. Right. And and the same yeah. thing is with, you know, Latin stories only existed in places like Univision, you know, or Telemundo. And outside of that, it was like. Yeah you better find a way to relate to these white people on your TV screen. You know what I mean? And and I think that's what right. people miss when they write this off is like, what does it really matter at the end of the day? Well, here's what people don't realize, right? And I think the pandemic proved this. And mm. this was one of my, like, I was I was very vocal about this in Minneapolis because as an artist, I had no benefit to write to anything. All of my work got canceled. All of my commercials that I had yeah. booked got canceled. All of my everything got canceled. And I had to really figure out like, okay, how am I going to live through this pandemic? Yeah. Because I didn't qualify for any help. For any anything, but I'm sitting here like everyone's locked up at home for a mm. month doing what? Right. What were we doing? We were watching movies. Mm -hmm. We were reading books. Yep. We were consuming music. We were like that. It's the main thing that, that we consume. Yeah. So it's like, how can it not be important? Yeah. Of course it's important. Like, right. <laughs> like it's like no, like 99% of people don't go a whole entire day without either hopping on their phones to look for content outside of right. themselves. Or watching the show that they love. Yeah. Or watching just like anything on TV. Like, mm -hmm. so it's like, yes, is important. And of, and, and, it, and it has shaped when we go back mm -hmm. to the start of cinema and we go back to a birth of a nation yeah. and how that film informs people on the evil of blackness and the mm -hmm. goodness of whiteness. Mm -hmm. That alone is your proof yeah. that media and TV and films and storytelling and everything is important. I mean, yeah. it shapes the entire fabric of this country. It, why do you think the slave masters didn't want the slaves to communicate and mm -hmm. to storytell? Right. Because they understood the power of storytelling. They understood the power of people coming together and creating art, mm -hmm. you know? And so, like, when you look historically back all the way, you can see how, like, we've been stripped of these things mm -hmm. because it's important. So don't <laughs> tell me. Yeah tell me that you know it's not important it's just tv so i'm really passionate about you know i can only speak about my lived experience mm -hmm. and one thing that i don't see enough of is us like the caribbean latinos being represented mm -hmm. and i'm very passionate about that because we move pop culture yeah. right like reggaeton merengue salsa bachata platano arroz con gandule mm -hmm. pastelón all of that comes from us in the Caribbean and us in the Caribbean were heavy influenced by like our Taino indigenous roots and our West African roots. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, you know, that in itself hasn't been represented on mainstream media enough mm -hmm. for us to be the ones that really drive Latino pop culture on a global level. Yeah. So for me, 
I don't want to create, you know, I try to not create content that's like, oh, here's this Puerto Rican that story. I just want to tell stories. And the, the main characters happen to be Puerto Rican and right. Dominican or Cuban mm -hmm. or happen to be, happen to look like me, happen to look like you. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the, the more we can, the more we can normalize that we're just people that live in this way. We're not this like cartoon character. Um, I feel like the, the more of this content will be able to get out there because we cannot please all of Latinidad with right. one single Latino narrative because that's just, we're not a monolith. It doesn't yeah. work that way. You know? Um, so it's, it's something that I'm, I, I've now have seen that like, especially the way, you know, I came here for modeling and acting mm -hmm. and I did, you know, when I moved here, I was, I signed, I moved out here because I signed and then I did a lot of commercials, did a lot of like print work and all of that. And then I've always hosted, but then when I landed in Black Unidad, it's like, I started, I always had this, this feeling in my gut that I was like, I'm really meant to be, you know, to, to put on kind of like my Issa Rae hat, right? Mm. And say like, what's not out there? What am I not seeing? What do I want to see? And like, do I have the means to create it? And, and then once I create it, I can employ whoever I want, right? Mm -hmm, <laughs> so mm -hmm. like, um, I think it's important for us to empower ourselves to, to, to see it in that way. And yeah. yeah, it's the harder route, you know, like, yeah, it's difficult. It's work. But it's your work. Right. Right. And so um, that's kind of the direction that I'm going. So when my father was released from prison in, in, uh, in November, mm -hmm. you know, this is something that me and my siblings have been dealing with for 26 years. Mm -hmm. And his story is really interesting. And I, you know, I'm not going to get into the case because like we're, well, that, that's another conversation. But, mm -hmm. you know, just this reintegration of this person that has been my dad via letters and pictures. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I responsibly being the person that I am calling myself a storyteller or whatever, I couldn't let this go by and not capture the story and not tell it in a way that shows, you know, the pain, the, the hope, the resentment, mm. but also the love, the family, you know, and I'm, and I'm telling it in our way. I'm yeah. not, I'm not doing it all in Spanish. I'm not doing it all in English. I'm not telling my brothers to, to drop their New York, you know, yeah. like yeah. Washington Heights accent. I'm not, you know, becoming anything to a piece to Hollywood. This is just our story. And I think it'll resonate with a lot of us mm -hmm. on the east side of the country yeah. because so many of us have been through this. Mm -hmm. And even down to the music, we're making a soundtrack for the film where I wrote a song, I'm performing a song, my brothers wrote songs. Mm -hmm. Like we're working with like, you know, we're making this soundtrack that represents us, our generation of like hip hop, merengue, bachata, R&B, because that's how we grew up. Sure. And those things, that's what carried us through the 26 years of having, you know, our father in limbo, if you yeah. will. So I think storytelling and tell, telling stories in your own way to amplify your people and your lived experience is, is important. And I encourage everyone to do it. Like, I feel like, you know, Mexico should have the same opportunity. You know, Black Americans should have their opportunity. You know, Africa, each, each, you know, I mean, Africa is wide and broad, right? Sure. Like, there's so, there's so much representation that needs to be had. So I think that I can only represent what I understand and what I live. And so that's, that's what I've kind of devoted my work to. Um, and of course, if somebody else loves my directing or loves my producing and they're like, we really want you to tell this story. Absolutely, you know, sure. but always through the lens of like accurately telling mm -hmm. that story and representing those people because I think that's important as well. So, so yeah, that's that's how I landed at Vida Nueva, um, uh, and I'm I'm excited about it. I'm nervous to put myself so vulnerably out there. Sure. Because let me tell you, yo, I'm the cry like I'm crying the whole <laughs> fucking film. <laughs> Like, when we went to DI, I was only supposed to interview my father, and I swear to God, like, my mom, rest, rest in heaven, my grandmother, we went to her land, we went to her house in El Campo, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, my brothers, right, you know what this is like, you're mm -hmm. from New York, you're Puerto Rican, they're yeah. also half Puerto Rican, Dominican, they're yeah. like, nah, yo, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk, you know, nah, this and this and that, all yeah. of a sudden, we get to El Campo, and they're like, nah, sis, I'm ready to talk. Mm. Nah, sis, I'm ready. All three of them, right? Wow. So then me and me and Chris, the DP, I'm like, yo, we gotta set up these shots. And then we're dealing with like sunset issues because mm -hmm. we were dealing with daylight. So I interviewed all of my siblings mm. and then 
And then I was interviewed. So by the time my interview happened, though, I was a wreck. <laughs> I can imagine. I was a wreck. I mean, I, I, I'd imagine like it, this also has to be incredibly fulfilling beyond just creating and telling a story that, you know, others can relate to that maybe hasn't been seen or told uh, on, on a widespread kind of level. I'd imagine selfishly, this was also probably incredibly therapeutic, even as you're talking about like your brothers then opening up. Right. And and it particularly as men, we are not taught to be allowed to do that. Right. To have these conversations, you know, or I know for me personally, like I'd still get uncomfortable if I'm really like sharing something with my sister or whatever. I have to like push myself through it, you know, so yeah. I can imagine it was therapeutic on so many different levels for you having this experience. It was, you know, it, it brought up a lot of feelings. Mm. Um, you know, all of us had our, our therapists and our, like our support. Yeah. <laughs> but at the end, I just remember, I remember doing the interview with my father, which we all, and this, mind you, this is the first time we hear our father talk about his perspective mm. of being in prison away from us. And it's the first time we realized that the only thing that kept him alive for 26 years was this glimmer of hope to be reunited with us. Wow. It wasn't to get back out in the world to ride a car again or mm -hmm. eat mango again mm -hmm. or no, it was it was to be with us. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And the moment when we saw him and he the moment that we like saw each other for the first time all, all together in DR, like and everyone will see that in the film. It's it's one of the most raw, intense yet beautiful and poetic moments mm -hmm. i have ever seen on camera yeah. you know um so it was this journey of like holy shit we're doing this and mm -hmm. this is great oh mm -hmm. my god you know so it was like a roller coaster but what i can tell you is that now me i'm looking through the footage i'm working with the editor you can see my brothers me my father it's almost like you can see it unraveling from off of them mm. you can see them like healing in real time on camera mm. you know you can see their their body language loosen mm. up by the end you can see there's just there's so much and um one of the things that we make sure we did was that we also captured like everything leading up to his release here in la mm. um because me and my brother where we were like, yo, we're going to document all these phone calls, the frustration, like, what is his release date? Is he getting released? Because we've been played for years. Mm -hmm. And then after his release, there goes his deportation. How long are the U.S. Marshals going to hold him? Where are they going to take him to? Is he going to have problems in DR? Wow. Like, what's going to happen? So it was like, you'll go through the movie and you'll see like, okay, we're getting ready. And it's Christmas time. And then he's released. Okay, now it's a deportation. And then they told us like two different dates. So we're trying to plan flights to DR. The dates are wrong. Mm -hmm. And then finally we have that day. He's released. And then we start planning to go to DR. We get to DR. We see him. And then we see him and it's like, oh shit. And then mm -hmm. we go to a sample and then we start talking about how we're feeling. Um, and to this day, I, it's weird that I'm like, I get text messages from him. You know, like we left him with a phone and a tripod. Yeah. He'd be like, <laughs> you know, calling and FaceTiming. I'm like, this is so weird, but I think this is when I just making this. Yeah. Cause I have made, I have a short film collection that I made before. Um, it was more experimental and I used the elements of like narration and color. Cause you know, we were just creating graphics. Me and some friends in Minneapolis were like, yo, let's just do something different. Sure. And so it was, it was, I, it's a creation, but it's not at the level that this film is. So creating this really solidifies for me, like, when we talk about that purpose, when we talk about like um, healing through storytelling, yeah, like it really put me in that position to be like, okay, this is, I love being on camera. I will always be like a performer and actor mm -hmm. and a personality, but I really want that the times that I appear on camera to do that, that it be for um, an impactful story, yeah. you know, and I'm okay to wait for the, I'm okay to wait for the right opportunities or to create the right opportunities for that. Mm. Yeah, um, I, that the, the, that's so beautiful. I'm like, I'm not even a, a part of your family, and I find myself getting a little bit emotional just hearing you describe it. <laughs> um, so that, I think I that's. Think, I, think, I don't know if I send you the teaser, but I'm gonna send you the teaser. It's literally 30 seconds, but yeah, I saw it. I did see that, so like it okay, is playing yeah. in my head. Yeah. But like hearing you describe it, it there, there's like a you know something to that. And I, I think that the last thing I want, I do want to touch on because I think. 
you know, obviously, historically, people of color have been over policed, right? And, and mm-hmm. that has mm-hmm. had an effect on the family dynamic, you know, uh, when you talk about persons of color. And I'm curious if you can kind of speak to that a little bit of like 26 years of not having your dad in your life. And obviously, you know, you're, you're on a great track right now, but what what are you what are kind of the feelings when you, you think about that or what you feel like you were you were missing or or how it made your life more complicated than it needed to be? Oh man. Um only like three hours to this drive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna say that, but let's see, because I, I could talk a lot. Yeah. Um I think number one, there was resentment, mm. right? There's there's um resentment on two ends, right? Resentment because he didn't make choices to um to not put himself in a position to where that was even an option Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. he was young and shit happened yeah and and then resentment from a heavy-handed judicial system that made an example of him Mm -hmm. being a black immigrant dominican Mm -hmm. who they had in their hands right Mm -hmm. um so there there's that layer of resentment then we go into personally as a woman how it impacted me to carry around the self the sense of abandonment Mm. right um because while yeah he didn't he wasn't not present in my life because he didn't want to but i always looked at it as like you still made a decision that landed you in a position to not be present in my life right and um and now i can you know like all of us have like forgiven that idea but when you're a teenager Mm. and when you're a young girl and you're starting to experience love and romance and this idea of self-worth and what you're willing to put up with from men Mm. and um when you're not when you don't know your worth because you don't feel worthy Mm -hmm. i mean i can tell you like i didn't start pursuing my dreams until i was like 30 Mm -hmm. because i never felt worthy i i i let a lot of toxic uh, shit happened in my love life because I had like this void that I was constantly trying to fill. And what's crazy about dealing with long-term imprisonment, it's, it's like a tease because you get this little three, five minute phone call and then they're gone mm. and then they come back up and then they're gone. And then you almost try to like numb it by being like, okay, well, this person just doesn't exist. Mm. But then all of a sudden you get a letter. And then the letter feels invasive because you're like, I'm trying to protect myself from this shit. Like, stop writing to me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But then you're like, damn, but this is my father. You know, um, it's so complicated. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And the way I saw it manifest the most was in me not uh, feeling worthy of my dreams and feeling worthy of like um, having like good things and mm-hmm. good people and experiencing good, healthy love, yeah. you know? Um, and I think that, that's one of my biggest messages to like any young girl that's dealing with any type of estrangement from a father figure. I can only speak of my experience, right? Mm -hmm. In that your value is not attached to that person or that person's decision Mm -hmm. to be there or not be there or whatever happened. And so I think I didn't know how to separate my value um, from the situation because I was young. I was 11 when he went in, you know? So, um, so yeah, it, it it definitely did a number <laughs> on a lot, and you know, and and for the first time in DR, an example is where I heard fully how it impacted my brothers, mm. you know, and how it impacted each one of them very differently, sure. even though all of them are male, you know. Um, so I think it also for me, it separated me a little bit from like my Dominican side of my culture because I, I you know I spent a lot of time in Puerto Rico with mommy and then we went to Minneapolis and I was always in my, my Puerto Rican side of the family yeah I was very like involved with going to New York I was always you know visiting my cousins in the heights and visiting my tias but I always felt like that piece of me was was missing mm. you know and it's wild yeah. it's very wild because in Minneapolis there's not many Dominicans there's more Puerto Rican than Dominicans mm-hmm. but coming out to LA I have found such a beautiful Dominican community here mm. and they don't even know that they have healed me. Mm. They have helped me heal yeah. in that way. And then to have that happen simultaneously when Poppy is being reintegrated into my life, I feel like I'm finally like fully myself. 
Mm. Like I'm 100% everything that Eliana is. I'm unapologetic about it. And all the work that I do is through the lens of what I've lived, what I've experienced and what um, people have told me that they resonate with. Mm. Um, I think that's how you how I kind of take it a negative and try to yeah. turn it into somewhat of a positive. But it was yeah. a lot, yo. Uh-huh. <laughs> all, the uh-huh. boys, all the fuck boys out there. All, the, all that shit. It was like, <laughs> no, I, I I appreciate you you sharing that. I think it's 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 important. You know what I mean? Because there's a few people that even come to my mind who I know have had a similar experience. That I hope they get to listen to this and and hear that, right? Because I, I know it's it's healing to not to not feel like you're so alone, right? And I think that that's oftentimes we think that we're just alone in this situation. There's nobody else that can relate to us. But I think that's why you know stories like this one are yeah. so important. So I appreciate you for. For sharing that, um, I, and I, there's so many other shit I want to get into. We'll do that maybe when uh, when the film is uh, completely released and all that. We'll we'll dive into yeah. more of a, a, the conversation. So Vida Nueva is the the docu docu film. Any idea when it's going to be yeah. out there for people to check out? Oh, so you know we're submitting to film festivals now, mm-hmm. um, and so you know once we finish our film festival run, um, we'll definitely put it out there. I'm definitely I'm I'm going big. I'm aiming for distribution like i really want the world to see the story um i think what's going to be really beautiful about it is that i'm making it a multimedia project it's a docu film but you'll have you know remastered photos it was mm. filmed on a red we're doing some ai storytelling mm. we have original music you know all of us are either rappers singers you know amongst my siblings so we really we're putting all of our creative hearts into the project and mm. it's an honor for me to lead it and be like the mama bear leading the, <laughs> you yeah. know, leading. Um, but I, I, I'm right now I'm going, I'm going to Minneapolis actually for a few weeks. Um, and I'll be working with the editor out there to, to really finalize it and really put it out to the film festival. Cause, um, cause yeah, we, we want the world to see it, but we'll, we'll see where, I don't know when I got to see what the rules are for the film festival submissions. Yeah. Um, of when I can do like small screenings or put it out. But in the meantime, I created an Instagram page called Vida Nueva Film. Um, I have, I haven't officially launched the GoFundMe, but we are going to be doing some crowdsourcing just to finish, you know, a lot of the like, a lot of the work that it needs to kind of button it up at the sure. end. Um, and, and yeah, just like follow us, support us. Like I am. I can't believe I'm even talking about this publicly because <laughs> this is just like an idea and yeah. now it's here. And it's, and the more I look at the footage, the more it comes together, the more I'm like, holy shit, Eliana, you did that. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. And where yeah. can, uh, where can people follow you as well to keep up all that you got going on? Yeah. Um, I'm at I am dot Eliana Reyes on Instagram. Don't judge me. Siti's not active on TikTok yet. <laughs> trying to figure out what my angle is. Yeah. I don't I don't do Twitter. So okay. if you want to support me, support my Instagram. Um and, and then I have a link tree there. You can see some of my storytelling performances. I also um I'll be posting soon my other short film series. Mm-hmm. Um I'm just I'm having a screening of it in Minneapolis with the cast and I'll be putting that out. Um but yeah, everything is just, it's just my Instagram, y'all. Don't judge me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, Yana, it's been great to, to finally connect. Uh, I genuinely enjoyed the conversation, so we'll have to have you back on soon. I did too. I appreciate you. And uh, uh, thanks for thanks for just giving me the space to and to have this conversation. I feel lighter already. <laughs> oh, good, good. I'm happy to hear that. Man, big shout out to my guest this week, Eliana Reyes, for hopping on the show. Man, I just love... I love having these conversations. They're just, I think, so incredibly important to discuss the diversity, the nuance that exists simply within our Latin community and how important and necessary these conversations are so that we can have a better understanding of one another and that we don't create this sort of feeling of, um, I don't know, this this like one drop rule almost, you know, amongst ourselves or this feeling of not not being comfortable in your own skin, right? And I think that's what obviously a lot of this podcast was was based off of. So love being able to bring this conversation to, to all of you. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, now with that said, let's uh, tie everything we talked about today in a neat little bow in a segment we call Conclusion Stew. Time for Conclusion Stew. Mm. 
<laughs> All right. So I think, you know, obviously we dove into a lot in that conversation. I think a couple of the things that really stick out to me from it was first sort of talking about the nuances of our community, of our culture, of our own personal lives, our own lived experiences. And I think not sort of, you know, I think I think traditionally we've created like this right way to do things, right? Right way to be Latino. And, you know, if you don't have this experience, that means that, you know, your um, trauma or or, you know, what you've experienced isn't quite as bad as me. So I don't want to hear it type of thing. And I, I think removing sort of those those mechanisms, those mindsets and just understanding that, like, we're all different and we all are, are going through shit. We've all have have suffered through different things in our own way. And of course, there is a spectrum in regards to certain conversations around racism or, um, you know, things like uh, police brutality or, or, or whatever it is, colorism. Of course, there are going to be different spectrums into what someone like myself's lived experience is going to be in that. But it doesn't mean that I don't have things that I didn't grow up um, having to deal with. And again, it's not trying to sit here and say that my trauma is at the same level or that, you know, I've lived in the same type of fear. But again, it's just understanding we've all gone through shit, you know, and the only way for us to progress and really be there for one another is to be open to having these conversations and to allow people to share their own lived experience, allow them to to be heard, right? It doesn't matter if you think what you've gone through is more difficult um, and, and they can't relate. We're all just hurt people who are trying to be heard and trying to heal at the end of the day, right? We've all gone through some shit. And at the same time, there is no right way to be yourself, right? Like we've been talking about, like our community is so incredibly diverse and made up of so many different and just amazing human beings. You know, the the idea that we're trying to fit ourselves in a box is a disservice to, to the incredibly diverse and, and vibrant culture and community that we actually have, right? So I, I, I think it's just, you know, being able to, to kind of have those those conversations and um, hopefully it opens people's minds a little bit just again to the nuance of it all and, and stop trying to make a one size fits all for, for something that is incredibly um, difficult to to place inside of a box. Now, the other thing that I think was, was really interesting, I love how she talks about sort of leaving corporate America. And, and I think she was saying even like at 30, she did it, which obviously is 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 young but in terms of what society tells us that's when you should quote unquote have your whole life figured out and, and all these different things right and i think that's so much of what i advocate for you know and, and it's not you know everybody should just go out and quit their job it's if you're unhappy at your job if you feel like it's not fulfilling you if you feel like your purpose is somewhere else then that's when you should be making that move and and it doesn't matter if you feel like you know you're a little bit older or you're a little bit behind you know um I, I think it, it's it's important to do that for yourself, right? To, to feed your soul regardless of what others are going to think about you. I mean, for me, I didn't get into radio until I was about 27, I think, right? 27, 28. And I know that that is young, but in terms of radio and, and in terms of media and all these things, like I was older having gotten in the door, right? A lot of these people had been there since they were interns in their early 20s in college, you know? Um, but again, it's just that was my path. This was my journey. And and I had to do what was best for me, regardless of what others might have might have thought. And and that's why I, I always strongly kind of push for anybody who listens to this and anybody out there who is sort of struggling with um, feeling like something is missing in their life. You know, it's encouraging you to to live that life of fulfillment and, and happiness. Right. I think that that's that should be the bare minimum. It shouldn't be, you know, a privilege. It should be the bare minimum. And again, we all have different circumstances like her and I were talking about. It's a privilege to not live in an area where I feel like my life is is being threatened each day and I have to be constantly on guard for that, right? Or that I feel like uh, my parents might be getting evicted and I have to figure out a way to help them out, right? Those are all things that I can't relate to. I know some people are going through the circumstances, so it makes it far harder for them to actually go out and live the life that they've dreamed about, you know? But it's just about trying to do your best to, to, to figure out a way and um, and and utilize whatever privilege it is that you have to to try and make things happen for yourself. I think again, just like, I think this conversation of like how nuanced life is. There are so many layers to it, so many layers to all of our own lived experiences, and we just have to continue to create space for allowing each other to be heard and allowing each other to share our own lived experience and understand understand that that's their experience, that's someone's experience. It's not for me or you to judge or to tell them that. 
it's right or wrong or that's lesser than my own experience like that's their experience and they should be able to share that freely just like i want to be able to share my own experience freely you know um and that will make us a stronger and tighter community that better understands one another and is able to then be there for one another in in the you know best ways possible so um yeah i don't know i, I really enjoyed that that conversation hope you all did as well and then the whole bit with her father and everything man it's crazy to think like how much of an effect our parents have on on our lives you know moving into adulthood right and um if we don't heal from those things how we can just begin to sort of relive maybe toxic cycles or have toxic mindsets about ourselves that lead us into situations that are lesser than ourselves right she talked about how not having her father led her to maybe having toxic relationships with men and the type of men that she was uh, attracted to or would go out with you know and i think that self-awareness is, is something that i'm just pushing for everybody to have you know i think it starts with self-awareness and and being able to recognize where are the negative patterns um, that you're picking up in life and and uh and where do they come from and then you can begin to unlearn them and, and correct them to, to become the person that you know you're, you're striving to be we'll get into i, I want to do a, a whole show on a lot a lot of those things as well i think there's so many really really just interesting conversations to be had about that stuff and i've been doing a lot of self-work on that recently so um i want to share a lot of that with y'all but man that's it I'll catch you on a Thursday with a brand new episode. Again, if you want to uh, sign up for the Just Be Social Club, our uh, private mastermind group, Brenda at mindofyounglord.com. We are going to be opening it up in July. So make sure you send her an email if you want to be a part of that. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thursday with a brand new episode of Thursday Trends. So then stay safe. We'll talk soon. Peace. Peace.